Namaste. Welcome to Urban Chatteraki. This is Abhinav Prakash. And today I'm joined by Shakti Sinha sir, who has been a prominent insider for many decades as the part of the Indian bureaucracy, then as the part of the uh, uh, Prime Minister office on the Vajpayee ji, and then he headed the Nehru Memorial uh, Library in Delhi. So welcome, sir, to the show. Thank, thank you. So, sir, since the conversation in the country is about insiders, is about the old elites, is about the Latians elite, and how that structure is changing under Prime Minister Modi, one thing often comes up is that when Vajpayee ji was the Prime Minister, and he was the first non-Congress Prime Minister to complete five years in office, it is often said that he never challenged the old power structure in Delhi, that he was just another Congress Prime Minister Right, so de facto he was a Congress Prime Minister. He never challenged the Congress system in the country. Do you agree with that point? I think I you know it's a thing which I've debated myself. In fact, when I was researching and writing my book, I debated this question a lot. I went to a lot of material, and I think there is a lot of merit in it. But I'll explain why. I mean, if this is a nuanced picture. One, of course, was that Mr. Vajpayee joined politics literally at the national level. He remained a Delhi person throughout his political life. Others have started in states. Some started even in districts and have come up. Samyaknasimara started literally at the village and the district level. His Ahmedabad then came up, right? Vajpayee actually began life at the national level itself. In the 50s, Nehru was such a big colossal figure in the country. The country also went through very difficult times. And there was a feeling that don't rock the boat. While we challenge the government, we don't challenge it beyond the point. And in times of emergency, we rally to the support of the government. So I guess the mental makeup of Mr. Vajpayee was of that era completely. You know, He was a man of his times. He was ahead of his times on many issues. On many issues, he was a man of his times. And yet at the same time, I think he had that lingering thing in himself to question it, because in parliament in 1998, when the NDA government was formed, and they were told he was criticized in parliament by his opponents, and you dropped your key issues of Ram Jan Bhumi, Article 370, and informed civil code, he says, we don't have the numbers. Hmm. Now, you know, by saying we don't have the number, he was clearly saying we have not given it up, right? It is just that circumstances are not right at this moment of time. So I guess he had that feeling that, yes, this is not the India that we want. This is not the Bharat that we want. However, because we are simply too small to do too much about it, we'll keep it on the side for the time being. Yes, but uh, that is about the political agenda. Yeah. But when we talk about the media, when we talk about the academia, when we talk about, let's say, the uh, uh, the informal structures of power. Right, right. right networks and those kinship huh. to keep the system going. Did he ever challenge it? I Okay, not head on, obviously not. not at, I, I, that's a very valid point you've got. But I think in his own way, different appointment made, reaching out, putting somebody like M.M. Joshi as the education minister, HRD minister. And these are not people who are completely comfortable with the system as it is, but prepared to challenge it. Hmm. The whole, you know, people have forgotten today Controversy of writing of history books, controversy of saffronization of not just education, but of the media. You know, I mean, he was criticized for that. All these charges were leveled against him in those days that you are undercutting the national consensus on culture, on social issues, and you're quietly saffronizing it. Now, by today's standard, it looks very tame, but the language used against him and if you read my book in the last chapter, I've actually quoted people. And if you remove the names and the dates, you would think it is a contemporary criticism of the BJP prime minister. So, you know, people also change. But at that moment, he was definitely seen as, yes, somebody comfortable in Delhi, but yet somebody who is a part of the agenda to actually change things. Of course, the, uh, the levels were very different. The kind of, uh, what should I say, structures in place were different then and now. So I guess that makes it more stark at this point of time. Uh, but do you think that under Prime Minister Modi, we are seeing that change 
that uh, the old power structure yeah. is yeah. now being slowly replaced by some new kind of structure. We don't know what it is, but there's certainly some yeah. flux at the top. And you know, when Prime Minister Modi came in part 2014, many people, oh, he's a reformer. At the end of the day, in power, you have to be at the center, which is what Mr. Vajpayee has to say, India can be governed only by the center. And therefore, they have found, if you look at the initial criticisms against Mr. Modi, who quite neutral in 2014. Amartya Sen even wrote an article saying that maybe things will good will come out of it, etc. Right? For which he was criticized also. So people thought in Delhi and the power elite of India that we will come to a modus vivendi with Mr. Modi. Slowly they realized that that is not happening, that Mr. Modi is going to the people directly over and above them. He does not need his thoughts to be intermediate to the power elite. I think that has been a big shock to them that suddenly they realized that, oh, the ground has been cut under our feet and we didn't even realize it, you know? So in that sense, yes, there's a distinct change happening. And you see the language being used, the criticisms being used in India, outside India, since we draw so much of our inspiration from London and New York, if you leave all that, since the language being used and if you walk around the city and walk around the country and meet people, the two different worlds, the criticisms and the reality are two different worlds happening. Precisely because the old power elite has been simply cut out of the Indian system and they don't know what is going to happen. So they are thrashing about and finding all kinds of excuses, logic, reasoning to run down basically. Yes. So basically it's their rage and fury which is being now heard across yeah, the world. Absolutely. That the Complete rage. And the fear that the way this man is going at the juggernaut who wins every elections, my God, even in Bengal now, you know, the touching concern people have and impressed. Suddenly they feel, oh my God, if this is permanent, then what happens to us? Mm -hmm. Earlier, governments came and governments went. So you had a hope of some revolving door after five years, right? Now the revolving door seems to be shut. <laughs> and therefore the rage is all the more. Uh, as as an Another insider of the Latin News Delhi recently remarked, quoted someone, in fact, in his book that Modi has taken the excitement out of the Delhi's party. You know, that those <laughs> Bangalore party and the garden parties. Is it true, sir? Uh, in fact, I would go much further. You know, if we took out the excitement of the party, they can replace it with a better drink. I don't care. What is he has taken it out? He has taken out that lubricant which kept this, the so-called parallelists moving. Mm -hmm. That lubricant which came from being either part of the government or being associated with the government or being able to influence government making. Oh, let's make so-and-so minister telecom. Oh, let's make so-and-so minister this or make this policy. That lubricant has suddenly gone away. Hindi mein kehne, dukandari band ho gai hai. That is a far greater uh, hit to them than the parties. Yes, the parties continue. They are depressed, no doubt. There's always New York to run to. But other than that, I think it has really fundamentally changed the city and hopefully parts of India now is the fact that old Dukandari, the old ways of doing business, backroom deals. It's not that everything is perfect now. Absolutely no. Nobody's case is that. But the fact is that model of cozy relationships have disappeared. But doesn't that have some side effect that you don't have enough people to man your institutions because you have cut out the old cultural, economic and uh, intellectual elite. So you don't have their replacement as a fear. So there's a crisis of governance, at least at the top institutions of this country. Would you agree to that point? Uh, see, there's a point to it. Let's be fair. There is a point to it. You know, elites don't change one on one completely. It's a slower process of changing. Vacuum every now and then. It's like, you know, when we fought for independence and the British said, we would love to give you independence, but you guys are not mature enough from independence. Fine. Mm -hmm. How do you get mature? If you have political power. Will you give political power? No. Why because you're not mature enough? There's a self-circular logic to it, right? Now, if you don't allow me to flourish, and then so you're not experienced enough. Huh? You haven't presented papers. Excuse me. Have you allowed me to participate in conferences? Have you sent me out to present papers? Are my papers being published in journals? No. And then you say, oh, you guys aren't doing anything. So you know that the transition to move from that old system to a different system will take time. If you go to England of the 17th and 18th century, America of the late 19th century, it was much worse. They were called robber capitalism, in fact. It was so bad things were. Everything was up for sale. All government offices in the USA were up for sale. 
as less than little 120 years ago. So when transitions happen, these things do happen. There would be temporary breakdowns. There would be temporary failures. If you don't live with that, you never succeed in doing something big. Because if you look for incremental change all your life, all you'll get is small, minor increments here and there. And the kind of change that India deserves, that the Indian people deserve, the opportunities they deserve, that will never happen if we keep waiting for the old things to happen in their own way. So I think the risk-taking was required. It has happened. It would be uneven. It would be jerky. I have to accept that change or evolution is not a picnic. So uh, I think we are, we are going to see many more years of chaos and flux because we are in this transition uh, process. But when we talk about the power structure of the country, and I'm talking about informal power structures, that the people who man the institutions yeah. and the bureaucracy, uh, you have seen uh, uh, this thing for a very long time as the part of the bureaucracy uh, and then uh, in different institutions. Do you see some change in the social composition of the people at the top? Absolutely. If I go back and I'm old enough to remember politics of the 1960s, mm -hmm. yes, it was very clean and neat. Why it was clean and neat? It was a cozy club of people, right? Mm -hmm. It was not that it was corrupt-free. It was not corruption-free at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, by not letting people into the door, that's one of the biggest act of corruption in itself. The first movement towards change actually happened in the late 50s with Charan Singh's opposition to Nehru's industrialization policy, as early as that. But it kept being hammered down then selectively, they were being absorbed into the system, very selectively, but being absorbed into this. In other words, you become like one of us, right? That transition which happened after 77 in the 80s and then post Mandal and 91 has really democratized the Indian system far greater. Democratization would call chaos, absolutely. Once, you know, your hierarchies are broken down, once the people, the Dalits, and many of the OBC communities can vote on their own, can step out into the public space and not do what they are told, preferably stay at home on voting day. Those changes, when they happen, obviously chaos happens. But the overall result, if I see, if I look at the civil services today, hmm. overwhelming majority of the new entrants into civil services are people from the smaller cities of India, are largely from rural backgrounds, have written papers in their own language, and I'm not just saying Hindi. You know, the first actually internal rebellion against the old structures, the elitist structures, the metropolitan structure, was in the 50s when Chaudhary Charan Singh opposed Nehru's industrialization policy very strongly at the Congress session. He was in a small minority, but he raised the voice. Gradually, with time, these voices became more and more but individually or sometimes local groups were being co-opted, absorbed into the system to make the system slightly broader, but it was not systemic. It was a clear case of co-opting to just give you a greater stability, but not really sharing power. That I think with the emergency 77 elections particularly, then in the 80s and then culminating in Mandal, and I would add even 1991, really changed the way politics was done in this country. Suddenly, it became more democratic. Suddenly, initially, the OBCs, and then from the late 80s, the Dalits started standing up. It led to temporary increases in violence, because now these people are actually standing up and not keeping their place in the sun as they were supposed to keep. But it suddenly changed Indian politics. It changed Indian systems completely, administrative systems and otherwise. And therefore, the old, very dignified parliamentary sessions, which are not always very dignified, gave away to a raucous parliament of shouting and screaming and people walking out and running and calling names. Assemblies, it happened much more. People have thrown uh, mics at each other and chairs at each other. But, you know, this anger which is coming out should have been expected. You had oppressed and suppressed these people for a long time. The old dignified method that you saw as order, they saw as an imposition on them. So by reacting in this manner, they are rejecting the old elitist power structures. That must be very clearly understood. If I look at the civil services today, the overwhelming majority of people coming in the civil services are from smaller towns. They're not from the metros. They are not English medium, Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, Marathi. They're, you know, so you're getting a tremendous diversity of people coming in. 
they are slightly older. I got it at 22. They are getting in at 27, 28, more experienced, set in their ways. It has plus and minuses. Far more tech savvy. They're really tech savvy. They can prepare all kinds of things on their own without help from Babu that we required in our days. So I think this democratization period of transition would be chaotic, would definitely lead to upsets, temporary breakdowns even, sometimes increased corruption. It will lead to, but far more involvement of the people with people down, quote unquote, the social ladder, seeing the system as relevant to their lives. So while we can happily say that I don't need the government, because I've got my benefit from the government every which way. They need the government, and therefore, for them, the elections are much more than showing a finger on uh, Facebook or social media that I have voted. You know, it's a real participant exercise for them, and I think that is for the good of India. Yeah. So, so when you're talking about greater democratization, there's also democratization of corruption in the country. So, so I will not take names, but we have a recent bail uh, given to a political leader. But you know, uh, but when we talk about uh, uh, the breakdown of the order because of the social change, uh, this argument that well, these people have been suppressed or oppressed, and now they're exercising power, so they don't have that tactfulness or that dignity in oppression, dignity dignified way of doing oppression. So does that justify the uh, this kind of chaos, especially uh, sometime that we saw in Bihar and other places? Does it justify? No, it does not justify it. I'm just saying you must understand why it's happening. You know, you must empathize with it. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm not sympathizing with it. Mm -hmm. But I have to understand why it is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, in such a case, smart political leaders, and I'm using the smart, very the sarcastic manner, are able to tell the people, here, I am giving you, fighting for you to give you dignity. In the bargain, please overlook my personal corruption, my family's corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a valid point that this does not give you an excuse to indulge in this kind of corrupt activity. Absolutely not. What I'm simply saying is that if I look at the proportionality of everything, earlier 10 rupees were spent, now 10,000 rupees are being spent. So corruption becomes more obvious now. But we have to make greater efforts to stop corruption, obviously. Greater democratization, more transparency helps. But all societies which have gone through such transition, England in the 18th century, America in the 19th century, every single public office were up for sale. Every single office were up for sale. It was so bad. When a person who had given money to a US president election, McKinley, to become an ambassador, didn't become an ambassador, he shot McKinley. He shot a US president. So you can imagine the kind of horrific things democratic societies have to go through. I'm not advocating violence, but if violence happens, we must know why it is happening. This is my point, you know. And what our old elite have failed to do in that sense, and I put myself there also, we did not realize that under the superficiality of order, actually there was so much of injustice built into the system, not just top versus bottom, but even within the layers themselves inside. And the kind of systems we had created with one group against the other group, balancing factors that to get out of it with democratization definitely would have risks of violence coming into the picture. So basically the system of graded hierarchy. So, yeah. uh, but when we talk about another very important uh, political, socio-political movement in the post-independent India is that of the rise of the BJP and the Hindutva movement. Yeah. How do you see the Hindutva? I'm not talking about the BJP per se, Hindutva yeah. as an ideology, where do you locate that in India's journey? It's a very interesting journey in the Hindutva journey in the sense that, uh, see, it's centered around basically the RSS. Initially, there were other bodies also, Hindu Mahasabha actually, because Hindutva was first used by Savarkar, but the Hindu Mahasabha lost, lost its way somewhere and became irrelevant. It Somebody embodied in the RSS is that it is a movement which is rooted inside society and yet wants to work to transform that society. It took its time getting its feet together. The assassination of Gandhi was a big setback to them, even though everybody later, including Patel and Nehru in their discussion, said, yeah, yeah, we know RSS is not involved, but there's a good chance to put them in their proper places, etc. You know, So it did put them in a massive amount of back thing. It took them a long time to recover. But I think in the 60s onwards, 
the famous alliance between Lohia and Dindyal Upadhyay in the 60s, which brought two disparate movements together for the simple purpose of challenging the hegemony of the Congress Party and being about social change. Or the then RSS chief Deva was saying in 74, the aprishata, if untouchability is not a sin, there is no sin. So the RSS has been part of society and therefore its effort to change society or make bring about changes, it doesn't want to be, this is an outsider speaking, okay? So I'm fully corrected by somebody insider. Does not seem to want to stay too far ahead of society also. And yet keep working in it to create a feeling of oneness, the unity of diversity, the stress on the unity and not the diversity. It has its downsides. It is seen as therefore anti-minority, even though again and again they have clarified that Upasana Padati is not our issue. India is your motherland, that is good enough for us, you know. But obviously politically it doesn't play out that simply and people do tend to then, and some workers themselves also are very party to it. To be fair, there are enough people inside themselves also who are not very clear about these things. But if I look at the period over the last 30, 40 years particularly, Nobody could have predicted that this force would become such a strong force. Mm. Yes, they would peak around, the political party would peak around 18, 20%, and that is about it, you know. But to cross 25 was across the Rubicon to political power on its own. And I think they have managed to do that by working within communities in a decentralized manner across the country. Mm. Now you have all these, as Badri Nayan's work, which you are very familiar with, you have these dozens of Dalit communities in UP varying in strength from 25,000 to one lakh. Mm. Now, one lakh spread over a state is absolutely insignificant. But to work amongst them, go into their racial memory and locate somebody whom they can all look up to, to give them the kind of self confidence that yes, we too have had a glorious history, we can also now stand up on our own, you know. So while government support is required, no doubt, but I can stand up on my own. I think that is the kind of work that they have done. Or the case of the uh, 377, where no political party or social organization said anything. Dattaji said in an interview to Open Magazine that we don't condone homosexuality, but it is not the job of the police to enter the bedroom. You know, so this kind of nuanced thinking which has developed over the years, obviously sometimes is out of sync with some of society. So it's not easy for them to push the argument. But I think overall, in 95 years, tremendous amount of achievement. So, so do you think the new cultural and social elites, uh, and because we already have political elites coming from RSS, but do you think that RSS will become the fulcrum of the new cultural and social elites in the system, replacing the old Nehruan elites now? Are we are we going to have I'm a not sure. elite in this country now? Yeah, no, I know. I was. It's a very good question, a difficult question, a trick question. Uh, I don't think there'll be a replacement of one elite with another elite. You know, the fact that this is a vast country and the fact that even within the unity, you're able to see that individual subsections have some role of their own, which does not challenge the larger identity. You know, the ability to exist simultaneously with two different sets of identities, one a larger, the great tradition, the front yard as against the Angan, and yet have the Angan intact, I think is very relevant. And if you have that in place properly and allow different thoughts to flourish locally, I think it would not be a replacement of one monolith by another monolith, but definitely much greater appreciation of India from Indian eyes, you know, without seeking validation, without finding out somebody else to tell you how good you are. We'll be able to see our strengths and our weaknesses. We have lots of weaknesses. We should study them, but we should study them with our point of view our fra our framework, not left wing, right wing, conservative, liberal, none of which fit into traditional Indian circumstances, you know. So I think I hope it is not replacement of one elite. I don't see that happening also. Even within the RSS, with the economic thinking, social thinking, there are different people speaking with different voices. So as long as the larger goal is the same, creating a larger Indian unity, I think you can afford to have lots of, you should have in fact, lots of different thoughts flowing simultaneously.
Yeah. But you pointed out that we should have our own point of view, our own theoretical constructs. And what we often see that in the name of having this Indic point of view, uh, we see rejection of the uh, all the theories, constructs, which are supposed to be vested. And then we're left with nothing. We are only left with the social orthodoxy in that country. Uh -huh. that, you know, the caste is uh, foreign, this is foreign, we had nothing, we had this thing. And then you start justifying everything which was there in the Indian society. Uh, do you think there's a resurgence of social orthodoxy under the RSS BGP? There is, there is some resurgence of social orthodoxy of people, but if you read them carefully, you know that they're not serious. But on the other hand, there are enough more people who are pointing to richness also pointing to potential problems. Also, so you know, it's not a it's unmixed, it's a mixed picture. It's not an unmixed picture. Mm -hmm. And the more we are able to get this mixed picture out to better appreciate ourselves, you know. I agree with you. If you reject all frameworks, you're in trouble. I only worry about the lazy categorization, liberal. I don't know, conservative. I mean, sometimes I really don't understand what it means. If a man on the religious extreme, jihadi, is referred to as a right wing. Jihadi is a right wing. Which definition is that? You know, so we, you know, we become too lazy to really do that. That is what I meant. Liberal to me means somebody, a person, or a thought of you which accepts diversity of opinion. Liberalism in practice in India and Western universities is if you don't agree with me, you're useless. You're rejected, right? Group think, group think takes over everything. That is completely wrong. So, but I agree with you that group thing should not be replaced by everything great about India. In which case, why are we going through all this if everything was great about India? And I, of course, very good things that happened in India. But I'm sorry, very bad things have also happened in India. Maybe we didn't, our ancestors failed at different places. Accept it. And that is something we need to study. But if you study it in a defensive manner, like today, to prove a point, then you will tend to fall on social orthodoxy. If you do it with a great amount of confidence, you are prepared to accept your shortcomings more confidently with a greater sense of equanimity. Yeah, uh, but you know, when we talk about India, so uh, do you think that liberalism has failed in India? Unfortunately, I mean, I always thought of myself as a liberal. But because you're, for you're, me- you're, How come you can think of yourself as a liberal? You serve in the Vajpayee's PMO. <laughs> you were this fascist apparently. <laughs> Because to me, a liberal accepts different points of view. I'm, I've, I'm curious. I do not accept the past as being only glorious or very bad. I have a critical, by critical I mean a healthy, not a criticism, a critical attitude, but I look for facts. I'm prepared to change my opinion. To me, that is liberal. But the moment liberalism now descends and you agree, today's liberals are happy to be called left and liberal together. I mean, left and liberalism are actually opposed to each other. Liberalism is about the individual. Left is about the group. And the group rights shall prevail. Even if I have to kill 10 million of my citizens, for the sake of the group, I will kill 10 million or 20 million. And you are happy to be a left liberal? So Indian liberals, even Western liberals, unfortunately now apparently, have lost their way completely. Tagore warned them against getting stuck in the dreary sands of time. They seem to have got stuck in those dreary sands of time by not being able to really contextualize their thinking in the changing circumstances of India. I mean, India has changed. On the other hand, the liberals will tell you the RSS is Brahmanical, etc. Then the one criticism, fine. Then we like Hindu orthodoxy because Hindu orthodoxy is very liberal. But no, Hindu orthodoxy is also Brahmanical. Mm. Excuse me, can you get your facts together? Traditional Hinduism, Acharya Tulsi Das, Ram Charitmanas, Hanuman Chalisa. That's not Brahmanical at all, right? I mean, get your, all these liberals who were against caste. Oh, we never discussed caste when we were growing up. We all post caste. Of course, we are post caste because we are all upper caste, right? We can afford to be post caste. I see BJP. What is it doing in Bengal? Is digging in caste? My God! And yet, in the UP elections, they were thrilled that between the everybody suddenly discovered that the Yadavs and their non-Yadavs OBCs and their 
jatos and non jatos that is they found out very excitedly that they will come together and defeat the bjp suddenly caste becomes good to defeat the bjp i mean if you have such attitudes how can i accept liberalism as succeeding in india you know and i think i blame the liberals precisely for that your lack of clarity find me the person i'll find you the argument if that is your logic the logic sir will fail come to it yes this the government has done right this the government has done wrong fine we'll accept you because the point is no government will not make a mistake absolutely but no government only makes mistakes you know so get your balance together santulan without santulan i think you know you lose your thinking process that is a tragedy that's a tragedy for india i would say because india needs good liberals who can question not accept orthodoxy basically they as of now they they are betting on mamta banerjee to save democracy in india and that itself is quite laughable <laughs> but coming to the second last question to you sir uh, how do you see the public intellectuals of india the eminent intellectuals eminent historians did they fail to do their duty or they were never eminent in the first place they were just a bunch of court historians and cabal who just occupied power and uh, derived legitimacy from that power now they have kind of lost it that's a tragedy no many of them were very talented many of them did very good work to be fair to them many of them really outstanding work and we're grateful to them for that you know excellent good work they did you know i may not agree with all of it but fine you were actually probing right as you were probing it was fine then in the late 60s when mrs gandhi decides to build an alliance with the left creates the indian council of historical research indian council of social science research jnu comes up so i start controlling now what is going to happen i completely change the discourse shift it this way and if you are with me fine everything is forgiven if you're not with me i'll ensure you do not get one rupee in public funding you will not get a job in a university so when you reach that stage then obviously these eminent intellectuals who are happy to be co-opted stop being eminent or intellectual at that point of time they become simply rent seekers and i think that is where the tragedy was india definitely needs good intellectuals public intellectuals i'm glad you raised the term people who are prepared to speak the truth people who are prepared to take a long view also you know don't be reactive you see something happening one person lynched terrible every violence is bad but the lynch person is sadhu suddenly there's no reaction you know it happens in maharashtra not the other but two sadhus are killed it's bad luck you know that kind of hypocrisy if you practice what kind of public intellectual are you you should be the conscience keeper of society tell us be frank with us and in this country we have always respected people who have spoken the truth respected people who have criticized the government they have all been treated very well nobody has been stoned to death for criticizing the king right we don't accept we accept that these things play that part honestly but the moment you get seduced by is the officers local access to resources foreign trip iccr fellowship you name it fellowship at the memorial the moment you get seduced by all this then you have sacrificed you have given away a very important part of your intellectual life which is your brain and your thinking part and that is where i think our intellectuals have failed us and because unfortunately on, on the other side we have not been able to develop a good body of scholars to really put it out in a very strong language the truth and not fall for the small little things of what a great people we've always have been and we were flag rockets etc yes we had tremendous medical advantages discipline the british have reported that after the second mysore war some british major had his nose cut off and the indian surgeon helped put his nose back this is recorded by the british not by you and me right distinguish facts put it out what we could do why every village in india could forge iron everywhere in the country we were forging iron till the early part of the 20th century today you are left nothing so you have lost so much why because we are not studying ourselves critically we are not studying ourselves with curious mind so i think public intellect to have a very important role to play in a young country like india we need about 26 we really need a public intellectuals to be good honest say that the emperor has no clothes where required but don't keep abusing the emperor even when the emperor has clothes 
<laughs> so uh, recently, Yogi Adityanath, who is supposed to be this uh, regressive parochial uh, politician in the country, uh, he has uh, converted all the government schools into English medium schools now, and that brings us to uh, two questions. One is that is this Hindutva, and mind you, Yogi Adityanath is not entirely Hindutva framework. He's what is called other saffron, you know, yeah. outside the Hindutva, food, far yeah. to the right of the Hindutva. Even he is doing this kind of social progressive yeah. policies, English education, transgender rights, and so on. So, are we seeing any possibility of emergence of a Hindu modernity? When you see the people who are completely right to the Hindutva itself. You know, even they are doing these kind of things. Is India moving towards this, let's say, a modern becoming a modern Hindu society? And I'm talking from the perspective of Hindus only, yeah. uh, no other yeah. religious community. No, I mean, I think it's a very good point. Actually, if you go back to Savarkar himself, I mean, Savarkar was a very modern person, very very modern person. You may not agree with everything, but very much. So he, founders of the RSS, they were all very clear. We have to learn from the West. We have to learn rationality, you know. So, which is one of the criticism against the RSS? Oh, you copied the West. You, you are traditionally orthodox, but you also copied the West. Terrible, bad arguments. But yes, I think the step that you mentioned, and though I may not fully subscribe to English medium schools, I would rather have English taught better as a subject hmm. rather than English medium. Because I still believe that Dr. Lohi had it right on that point. But leaving that aside. I think from that time of Savarkar and RSS beginning, but anyway, to now, over a period of time, we have reinvented Hindu society, has reinvented itself very, very considerably. I mean, I grew up in the Bihar of the early 60s. Socially, and you can't distinguish the two. You know, I mean, Hindu as a religious symbol and Hindu as a social thing, you really can't distinguish them. It's a massively overlapping phenomenon. I mean, the kind of social structures we had in place as late as the mid and the late 60s is unthinkable today in Bihar. Absolutely unthinkable. All in 50 years. Most societies to undergo modernity. England no, had a civil you war. Point because nowadays we see lots of denialism uh, yeah. that uh, before it is, the things were not so bad. Uh, we, we see that on social media that, you know, it's only yeah. because Lalu, everything got bad. And my point is that the things were bad even before that, Lalu Absolutely. just made it uh, worse. That's, yeah. So could you yeah. elaborate upon that point? What was the situation in the 60s? Well, I'll start with a very simple case. In the 60s, well, 70s, you could not, if you wanted a telephone at home, waiting for 15 years. If you wanted a scooter, two-wheeler, 17, 18 years. We are male dominated society. Male child is born, father books a Bajaj scooter. Then Vespa became Bajaj, right? <laughs> so economically, we were terrible. You could not buy a watch. One watch, HMT citizen, one week's waiting period. A cycle, 10 days waiting period. Economically, we were very bad. I don't know how people say great age. Socially, it was frozen in time. The people who are trying to rebel against the system and the cases of atrocities on Dalits in Bihar that I remember those days, some Dalit had a fight in his village, ran away to Calcutta. The landlord's family went to Calcutta, picked him up, beat him up, put him in the trunk of the car, drove him back to Bihar in his village. Then he was publicly flogged, whole family, etc. Horrible thing, horrific things happening. On a routine basis, we didn't make it to the papers, but this was expected, right? This was standard, standard operating procedure. I mean, I mean, if anybody says those are good old days, I'm sorry, that was not good old days at all. I mean, socially, why do you think Naxalism picked up in a very big way in Bihar very quickly in the early 70s? Yeah. It was waiting to be ignited. You had created circumstances for complete social breakdown. Fortunately, I must give the society, the resilience in the society, and the two are 80% the same, that we were able to absorb these changes in 20, 30 years, 50 years, without the scale of violence that England America, France, Russia, or China. All these societies went through modernization by killing 10 to 15% of their population. Mm -hmm. Other than the great killings of the partition, touch wood, if you look at the violence figures in India, there have been much of the dislike violence. I completely condemn all forms of violence. Violence was much less in India. We were able to make this transition into accepting being far more equal 
Even if mental discrimination remains, many people, fact is socially today, nobody will stand up and argue in favor of discrimination. Mm -hmm. In the 60s, people would not stand up and argue for equality, mm -hmm. equity in such a manner, you know. Tremendous amount of change. There were no good old days. It was the peace of the graveyard. I don't think so anybody sh should call it economically, socially, politically, every which way. There were not good old days. It mm. may look good because we were there in power. We had no challenges, mm. politically, socially, economically. So we were cut off. We were very good. We had electricity. Not a single village had electricity in most of Bihar. Then, and, and rest of India also, you know. So don't let anybody seduce you with the thought that they were good old days. They were not. But will India become a modern society, as we were discussing? Is it possible in the coming decades? Or we will change, yes. just like most of the societies we have tried, except the West and the Japan? I think so, because one good thing is here is that traditionally, this is one thing to our strength, a society is bigger than the state. Mm. The state is a component of our society. Many Western societies, the state creates society. States fashion society. Here, societies fashion the state, make changes in the state, which is why you require state intervention. Dr. Ambedkar was a big fan of it. So was Jawaharlal Nehru for different purpose reasons. Fact is, many of those interventions have not succeeded, while otherwise changes happened on their own. So it's not to suggest that the state should not be committed to equity. Of course, the state should be more than committed to equity. In fact, when you look at any panel, you must make sure that enough diversity is there. As a small case, a small example, you know. We should consciously about it, but internal processes within society, I think are as important, if not more important. You can make me say good things, but to do good things, I must be convinced internally. And I think that is where India, I can see it happening because the kind of churn you see across the country. And despite COVID, I have traveled North, South, East, West extensively in the last one year. I must say everywhere that I go to, you see pride in the people. You know, that kind of now showing, mm -hmm. which I think is a very good harbinger of change. Excellent, sir. So uh, we must end here now because we have to keep something to discuss in the next round when we invite you. But thank you, sir, for enlightening us. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure listening to you all the time and now talking to you also. Thank you, sir. And thank you, audience, for listening to us. Please subscribe to the channel and join as a member if you like. See you soon.